Over 130 residential schools operated in Canada. The first federal residential school began around 1883. The last closed in 1996. We Stand Together invites Indian residential school and day school survivors, 60 scoop and intergenerational survivors, to share their truth. This project is an opportunity for those on their journeys of healing to share their experiences and perspectives so all can learn about the effects of residential and day schools and the challenges Indigenous communities still face. Okay, my name is uh, Louis Cassage. I'm uh, 60 years old. I was in the ward of a children's aid society in the early 60s. And I can remember to about three, four years old when I was in numerous homes. And the one uh, home that really affected me, I had a flashback in uh, 21 years old. And I was in Seven Sisters Falls. I was just a little boy of three years old. These uh, two white guys put me in a boat with no life jacket and they're trying to drive really erratically to try and kind of have an accident for me to uh, drown. But I was uh, clinging to the edge of the boat, trying to survive and to be strong and I surpassed that test. And then they uh, went to the shore and then they tied me up to a pole and then they, uh, they whipped me. And I still got these whip marks on my back to this day. And so strange how I had this flashback and that was me in that picture in my head. And uh, like Children's Aid Society, they treated us like a piece of furniture. They didn't check us for sexual, sexual abuse or physical abuse. And they just moved us from family to family and uh, and then back in the 60s, when your mother was underage, she was not allowed to keep the child till she was 18. And my uh, half-sister, my mother had her when she was 17, so my half-sister had to go and get adopted, so that split up our family. And I got to meet her for uh, a few years, and then I uh, lost track of her. and. And then when my mother uh, passed away, they didn't tell me till I was 18. They withheld that information from me. That really disturbed me and bothered me and hurt me and kind of was angry at society and they just took my freedom of rights away. But the good thing about that was when my mother passed, I checked her obituary to all the names in the obituary. And I found my, my grandmother. She lived at Pritchard, Northside, Winnipeg, for many years. And so I got to meet her for about two, three years till she passed away. And at least I got to know my mom's mom. And then when I was at the funeral, I was being a pallbearer. And I played a fast pitch team. And they were saying, Louie, what are you doing here? And I says, well, that's my granny. And then they yelled out, we're related. And we were playing ball like for five, six years already and we didn't even know that we were related. So some things came from a, a negative to turn it into a positive, which was nice. The system in the Children's Aid Society back in the 60s was similar to the 60s scoop because a lot of white people, Métis, uh, whatever race, we dealt with these issues from the very beginning, and it was very bad back then for uh, discrimination and racists. And it seemed like in school, I had to fight every day, and my desk was always in the hallway because I was in trouble from defending myself. One day, this bully in the schoolyard, he come running up behind me to fight me, and he grabbed me by the shoulders, and kind of jumped up and he banged his head on my head and he lost two teeth in my head and then he ran away crying and from there on in, I didn't have too many issues in school. I was very athletic and everybody wanted to be on my team for sports and stuff. 
It's affected my life. It's affected my children's life because I had addictions and alcohol abuse and drug abuse because of what happened in my life. My life is like kind of lost most of my life due to the fact of what happened to me in my in my youth. I think about it from time to time, but it seems like no counseling's ever gonna to cure me because I've been marked so bad and I've been hurt so bad and I've been betrayed so bad from the government. I don't understand why things were like that in the 60s and the 70s, but finally I met a good family that loved me like their own, Mary Jane DeRoche in Cypress River. I can remember October 31st, Halloween in 65, and it was just a beautiful, sunny, warm day and at the end of October, and that was the first day that I uh, spent my life with for Halloween and went to Cypress River, just like a 400 population uh, little village out in southwestern Manitoba. And I spent there till my mother had a nervous breakdown, foster mother, and then two years later she got better like miracle and then she called me back wanted me to come back and live with her and i said sure no problem i'll be right there so that was a miracle for her to get better because usually when you have a nervous breakdown you don't recover so we got to spend uh, the rest of my uh time till i was 18. that was 1981 and then uh, I was in a school. There was not much work out in the country because we had a farm and we rented the farm to the Hutterites and the foster dad worked at Royal Paving on the road. So then uh, they bought a house in Glenbro. I went to Glenbro School, high school. Came to Winnipeg in 81 to look for uh, work. And then I went to uh, Red River College in 84 to uh, be an auto body repairman. And then I kind of lost track. I used to go to the country every uh, weekend to play hockey because I played hockey for Cypress River Roadrunners Liniment League. And I would travel back and forth numerous years and finally grew out of it to uh, reside in Winnipeg and be a basketball player. and. Traveled the uh, province and the country and our abilities, which were very good. We ended up getting fourth in the National uh, Aboriginal uh, National League in Canada at Fort uh, Rupert or Fort George out in BC. So I was blessed with the sports to uh, subside my pain from what I went through. Sports was one way of making me strong and try and forget about what happened in my life. It was an outlet for you. Yes, it was an outlet, yeah. A very good outlet, very healthy. But living out in the country was so much better than being in the city. You know, in the city there's gangs and stuff like that. And there wasn't nothing like that back in the, in the 70s. You know, a lot of people often think that residential schools and the discrimination of the Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, and uh, uh, Inuit, that it was something that happened way, way back in the history of like Canada's past. But it's something that we're still seeing today. You're an example. 60 years old, you were around and experienced these horrific acts and the dehumanization of an entire peoples. And we're continually continuing to see the struggles today with First Nation communities fighting for access to clean, uh, clean drinking water, um, governments and corporations avoiding actually having conversation and dialogue with them in terms of projects, or, you know, no, no access to health care up in... Um, like Northwest Territories and places like that. They have to fly all the way down here to Winnipeg just to receive certain treatments. 
not too uh, thrilled about how it is out in the rats. Like I'm not a personacious person, but the way they live out in the rats, they have no water. They pay so much uh, money for uh, milk and food. Just because they get a free house doesn't mean that they're uh, living well. It's just like under poverty and there's not enough uh, recreation for the children to uh, keep sober and get them out of uh, drugs and alcohol. They have to have some resources to keep those children uh, with their heads up and to do well. It's just kind of like set up for failure from how it, how it works. I never lived in the res, but my ex lived in the res, and there's a lot of uh, sexual abuse and physical abuse, and there's not much of a judicial system out there to uh, stop this uh, trend. It seems like it starts from uh, from your youth, from your parents being alcoholics, and then it rubs off to the kids, and it just keeps the cycle active and we have to put a stop to it. We have to realize what it's doing to our lives. Our lives will be so much better if we can stop the cycle of violence and alcohol abuse and substance abuse. And plus education is very important. A lot of uh, First Nations kids, they don't go to school, they get hooked up with gangs, and then the high population of uh, being incarcerated. There's just got to be some way that we can help these people because it's not a great way of living. There's not much to look forward to in life. And that's why they turn to their alcohol and drug abuse because they give up and they have pain because what happened in their youth. From the perspective of allies, what do you think that people like myself can do in helping with advocacy or making a difference? I think it's good for them to come together and uh, express their, uh, their feelings and their rights just to let people aware to how they feel and what they went through in their lives. Because I'm sure a lot of people don't have any idea what they went through. You know, when there's a positive, there's a negative, and uh, vice versa. For newcomers coming to Canada, immigrants and everything who are coming here, whether that's refugees now from, like, Ukraine running from the war or people just moving to Canada because they think it'll be a, a new opportunity and then they're coming here and they're kind of seeing things that are happening with Indigenous folks, First Nations and everything. And they're kind of very wondering about what the history is about. What do you think are some things they could do or should do to be better aware? Maybe support the people that need help and uh, listen to their side of the story for they understand what's going on because they're newcomers in Canada and they don't really know what's going on because I'm sure in uh, Ukraine and that their life is much different than what their life is in here because of the wars and the people that are dying, children. But I seen a few, a couple of them the other day, they seem very happy and in Winnipeg, a couple from Ukraine because I could tell how their, their language was and they seem to be enjoying Canada so so much freedom and less uh, less problems in the politics of war and you can actually live a happy life here rather than being in their country. So I'm happy for the newcomers to uh, be a part of Canada to make the country a better place. Maybe that will rub up on them. Will, them will rub up on us to uh, make life more better for everybody. Do you still uh, speak 
uh, your kind of traditional language or are you connected to your traditional teachings at all? Or is that something that was lost completely? I lost that completely. My uh, first language as a baby, I, I spoke French and I uh, lost my French in grade nine. So I understand bits and pieces and then I understand a little bit of Soto from the kid's mother and stuff because that's what language she spoke. But I've been around that language for a while and I understand here and there, but the French, I really miss that I lost that French. Nice to be having two languages. Different, but my first language was French. And I'd like to know where this came from, from which family, because I was in a lot of different families. And finally, I settled in on Cypher Server with Mary Jane Jeroshi. That was the best thing that ever happened to me, because there was no more, there was no more abuse. But the problem was, her husband was uh, prejudiced. Whenever he was around with me, he would always say, Goddamn Indian, Goddamn Indian. And that was kind of hard, but when he passed away, I went to his funeral, I forgave him. Mary Jane, like, was just a very sweet, lovely woman that did the best that she could for me. And uh, I remember I went to the home care in Glenboro there with my ex girlfriend about five, six years ago. She was using a walker. She seen me, like she calls me Jimmy, because my name is Lewis James. Jimmy, she just throws her walker and she comes running to me and gives me a hug. That was just so fulfilling and that was the last time that I seen her. And I guess I missed her funeral too. Nobody could get a hold of me. And that's just how my, my life is. I miss the important things to say goodbye, but at least in my heart, I can do that. And I know she's in a better place and she lived a long, beautiful life. And I love that woman as much as I love my real mother. And I also remember in uh, 1966, in Portage of Prairie, my foster mom drove me to Portage to meet my real mom, to try and, she's trying to get me back. I had the feeling, I don't know, sure she's my real mother, but I just had that feeling not to go back to her, because I could feel something with her, uh, an issue, a problem. Maybe it was her drinking or whatever, maybe not her love, but I, refused to go back to her. I had a chance to go back to her in 66. And then she passed away in 74. So I don't know if she just gave up. Because I know she loved me, but she had her uh, alcohol addictions. But I still remember her face in my, uh, in my memory. Long, black, beautiful hair. Thin woman, very pretty. And I kind of remember my, uh, I don't know if it's my bio biological father or my uh, Italian uh, biological father. I kind of remember him. He bought me these two or three plastic cars. I remember he had a kind of a short gangster hat and he was short and he'd speak past. It's like the only image I have in my mind of my mother and my father. Because I got a pretty good memory for 60 years old. And maybe it's not so good because of all the things that happened to me and I remember and that kind of affects me, but that is me. Happy to be here. I'm here for a reason, I'm here for a purpose, so. I got a car accident in 2018. I broke my back and then I had my stroke six months ago. So it's like some of my friends say I'm immortal. But I know my time will come. I'm not scared. Life is like bingo. When your number's called, it's time to go. And whenever 
the creator says it's time to go, I'm ready to go. I have more people up there than I know down here. I got a lot of people up there, they're waiting for me, but I'm not in a rush, but when it happens, it happens. So all I can do is live the rest of my life to the best of my ability and to be happy, and that's all I can do. And I'll leave it at that. Umulticultural is located on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the national homeland of the Red River Métis. With Umulticultural, I'm Ryan Funk. <laughs>